Day 1 Colonel Chad Hogan of the U.S. Army imagines there's no place on Earth worse than the POW camp he's currently being held in the Philippines. It's early 1944. He was captured in 43. Right now, he has no idea that the camp in the Philippines is a better place to be than the camp he's getting transferred to. At this very moment, he's standing in a line made up of mostly U.S. POWs about to board a ship that's part of a fleet they've nicknamed the Hell Ships. Day 2 Hogan is on the ship. He and the other men haven't been fed, but it could be much worse. He thinks back to the 66-mile march he and the other prisoners were forced to go on under the hot Philippine sun. Many of his friends died or collapsed from exhaustion during this hike from hell. Hogan sitting next to another prisoner, a captain from the U.S. Air Force who was captured just after the Japanese bombed an aircraft unit on Nichols Field close to Manila. The Americans fought bravely, but in the end, many of them were killed or taken prisoner. Hogan looks at this young man, Captain Tim Flowers, and recounts the memories of the march. They were shoved into the boxcars where there was so little room that they all had to stand up. By the time the train arrived at its destination, many prisoners already weakened from the march died. Nothing, Hogan thinks, can be worse than having a dead guy propped up against you for hours in a sweltering train carriage. Flowers said he also can't imagine anything worse than what happened at his own camp in the Philippines. He too has seen the worst of humanity guys slowly dying, looking like skeletons, sleeping in their own feces. Every single day, he tells Hogan, we were digging another grave. Flowers doesn't have the stats at hand, but a U.S. prison doctor ended up crunching the numbers. The doctor was Colonel James W. Duckworth. Duckworth wrote that from April 15, 1942 to July 10, 1942, 21,684 Filipino POWs died in the camps. That was 249 a day. 1,488 Americans died more than 17 a day. On one particularly bad day, May 22, 471 Filipinos died as well as 77 Americans. Wherever they're taking us agree the men can't be as bad as that. As the ship rolls through the waves, taking them who knows where, the two men form a bond while talking about their lives back in the U.S. Flowers comes from a farming family out in rural Ohio where he says life is simple. He used to wake up every day next to his wife in a house where the smell of baked bread filled his nostrils. Hogan is a city boy from the tough streets of New Jersey, but he wouldn't have it any other way. Day 3 A few prisoners have already died. The men still haven't been fed, and so for some already starving POWs, the journey is just too much. The Japanese don't even throw the dead overboard, and the deceased soon start to stink in the ultra-humid conditions. Most of the prisoners have ripped bits of their clothes off to make a rudimentary face mask. As bad as it is, it's nothing they haven't seen before. Hogan turns to Flowers and asks him, what's the worst thing you ever saw at the camp? Flowers doesn't spend too long thinking about it. He tells Hogan, one time the Japanese threatened the prisoners with death and mass if they didn't work harder. They made good on the threat. He said they forced around 150 prisoners to dig their own graves. Then they were all thrown in and the soldiers covered them in gasoline and set them on fire. It was the expressions on their faces as they were digging that I'll never forget, says Flowers, and how the Japs thought the whole thing seemed normal. It was like they had no humanity left in them. Day 4 One of the prisoners is delirious. Stuffed down in the cargo hold, the prisoners can hardly breathe. It's enough to send anyone mad. What makes it worse is that the Allies have no idea these ships are carrying their own soldiers, so there's always a chance the ship could be taken out by an Allied submarine or a plane. This will happen to many of the Japanese hell ships throughout the war, killing many if not all of the POWs on board. Of the 126,000 Allied soldiers that will make this journey during the war, about 21,000 won't get to their destination alive. For some of their families, it'll be decades before they know what really happened. In some cases, when Allied bombs do drop and the ships burn, the prisoners try to clamber out of the holds, but as soon as they pop their heads above deck, they're shot. The threat of death from a bullet usually doesn't stop others from trying, because anything's better than being burned alive. The delirious soldier doesn't know what he's doing. He's swinging a canteen above his head. The urine he's kept in it sprays over the other men. More mayhem ensues as he lunges out at one of the guys. He snarls like a dog and sinks his teeth into the man's arm. Just two years before this nightmare, he managed a gas station with his pop. Having heard the shouting, Japanese soldiers rush down to the hold and start lashing out with their batons. One of the prisoners suffocates as he's squashed between men who are just trying to get out of the way of the batons. It's 110 degrees in the hold. The prisoners barely have a few inches of space in which to move. A bloodied man then tries to stand, only to slip on the pervasive feces and vomit. He falls back, hits his head, and passes out. The other men barely give him a second look as he lays dying in the sludge of human waste. Someone must be peeing on the deck again. The pee rains down on the fallen fella. This is why they're called hell ships. Day 5 The ship is under attack from Allied planes. 
The prisoners sit and grit their teeth as the bombs fall from the sky. They hear screaming from the decks. These are not the screams of soldiers. The ship's passengers include almost a thousand Japanese civilians. Women and children duck for cover as more gunfire rains down on them. Three of the prisoners climb the ladder hoping to reach the deck. Machine gun fire erupts, and one by one they all fall back down, now covered in their own blood. The chaplain takes stock of the dead men that now surround him. He mutters under his breath, forgive them, they know not what they do. An hour or so later, Japanese soldiers collect the dead prisoners. Each one is thrown overboard without a modicum of respect. The Japanese don't want the prisoners to die, even though it might sometimes seem that way. It's counterintuitive to kill your slaves. There's work to be done, the most brutal work imaginable. Quite literally, the prisoners get a taste of things to come. On the ship, the same rules apply regarding sustenance. That's 10 ounces of rice daily, the same as in the camps. They might get 4 ounces of fish a month if they're lucky. Pork is a luxury, but by the time it gets to the prisoners, it's usually already rancid. Men dying from dysentery is a daily occurrence, and with only around 200 calories of food a day coupled with backbreaking work, the prisoners soon become dangerously emaciated. Just little water was provided for the hundreds of or thousands of prisoners. Many would wait for hours at a time just to fill a small canteen with dirty water. Rivers or other bodies of water would often be dirty enough to spread dysentery. Others will starve because the food won't even get to them. It'll be stolen by the Japanese guards who themselves at times will be starving. These soldiers will steal the Red Cross parcels that are sometimes sent to the camp. Of the 27,000 Americans that the Japanese take prisoner, only 60% of them will survive. One in three of the 140,000 Allied POWs from the West won't return to their families. Day 20. The ship finally arrives at its destination, although the prisoners have no idea where they're about to disembark. There are many POW camps in Japan, but many in China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Korea, New Guinea, Malaya, Singapore, the Philippines, Manchuria, and quite a sizable number of prisoners in Thailand, only recently called Siam, Burma, now Myanmar, and the Dutch East Indies, now Indonesia. Many of the Allied prisoners are from the USA, Australia, Canada, Great Britain, India, the Netherlands, and New Zealand. Outside of Japan, enslavement consists of doing things such as building bridges and railways, such as the so-called Death Railway, spanning Thailand and Burma. It's there that around 60,000 Allied POWs work in savage conditions. Close to 90,000 Southeast Asian civilians also work and die building this railway. In Japan itself, the prisoners sometimes work in deadly coal mines. Some of them help to build munitions factories and shipyards, but this is no ordinary work. It's slavery. If the men don't die from malnutrition or disease, there's a good chance they'll be beaten to death or shot. Some of the more unruly prisoners will be set on fire. If the ship was hell, the camps are just another level of hell. You could argue that the lowest depth in which a prisoner can sink is being part of one of the unholy medical experiments ran at some of the camps. These match anything the Nazis are doing. If the Kenpai Tai, aka Japan's Gestapo, select men for experimentation, they will experience a truly horrifying death. But Colonel Hogan and Captain Flowers are, for now, just relieved that they've made it through that grueling journey across the ocean. They don't know it yet, but they've landed in Taiwan. The two men part ways at the dock. Hogan tells the younger man, when this is all over, I'm gonna go see you in Ohio. Flowers smiles and says, deal, but he knows there's a good chance they'll never see America again. Hogan and a group of other prisoners have been told nothing about where they're being sent. They know better than to ask. If they so much as look at a Japanese soldier the wrong way, they might get the butt of a rifle smashed into their face. As they're herded onto a train, they quietly chat among themselves. Some of them are British, Australian, Canadian, American, and Dutch. Day 21. Hogan is sitting in a bamboo hut with around 20 other guys. Some of the other men are close to death already. One guy, a Brit, goes by the name of Tommy, notices how distraught Hogan looks. Tommy tells him, word of advice, mate. If you want to get through this, keep your eyes open for mice and rats. If you're lucky, you might catch a snail or a snake. Other than that, you'll have to rely on the rice they give us, which as you can see isn't anywhere near enough, especially if you're sent to work in the copper mine. Tommy explains that there's no such thing as medical care. He tells Hogan that sometimes the guards beat the prisoners for no good reason. It's as if after getting in trouble with their commanders, they take their anger out on the POWs. This is almost a daily occurrence, says Tommy. Japanese officers often strike their subordinates. Consequently, the subordinates hit out at the only people below them, the prisoners. Just be thankful, says Tommy, that you're not in Burma building that railway. He tells Hogan that he was there, but right now he doesn't want to talk about it. He'll tell him the details later. Just as Tommy said, the amount of rice Hogan sees in his dish each day is pitiful. He's just worked for 14 hours straight on the nearby mountainside, planting sweet potatoes and peanuts. His job today is to spread fertilizer on the ground. It's not a pleasant job, given the fertilizer comes from the fly-infested open latrines in the prisoners' huts. Japan didn't sign the Second Geneva Convention of 1929. 
This means the prisoners in Japan's eyes are fair game for any kind of horrible treatment. The country does have rules according to the regulations of the treatment of POWs, but how they're applied differs greatly from camp to camp. In the better camps, prisoners can use their earnings to buy more food, cigarettes, or a coat for the winter, but in the other camps, none of these things is available. The going rate of pay, if prisoners are paid at all, is 10 sen a day for a private, 15 sen for a non-commissioned officer, and 25 sen for an officer. The money isn't hard cash, but a number written in an account book. Day 23. Hogan is handed some items. These include tenugui, a Japanese cotton towel, jikatabi, some work shoes, and gunte, work gloves. Relief soon turns to despair. He's supposed to bow when receiving things, and this particular guard isn't in a good mood since he's just been told off himself. He gives Hogan a good smack in the face, an action the Japanese call binta. Tommy says to him, you're lucky, mate. He points to a guy under a blanket in a corner. He was made to stand for 12 hours with a bucket of water on his head, says Tommy. When he spilled some, he got his jaw cracked with a rifle butt. He's now dying from an infection. That's when Tommy tells him the story about the two men who tried to escape from another camp. They were Coleman Grealish of the 60th CAC US Army and Thomas Joynson, a Brit from England's Manchester Regiment. They actually made it out, says Tommy. But it's safe to say those two white geezers wandering around Japan during wartime turned a few heads. They were both arrested and subsequently interrogated by the Kempai Tai. What exactly happened to Grealish and Joynson at the hands of their interrogators is unknown, but Tommy says they were later dragged in front of all the men during a parade, both of them quite literally broken, their faces no longer recognizable. They didn't even have the strength to stand up. The English-speaking Japanese commander announced to the prisoners take one good look at these men, because it's the last time you'll ever see them. They were transferred to another camp, and according to Tommy, they were forced to dig their own graves and then beheaded. Tommy is actually wrong. This is a rumor that circulated in the camps. Both men were shot and killed. Rumors like this often get around the camps because stuff like that does happen from time to time. Day 28. There's a massive storm and the copper mine flooded. Hogan finds out that six prisoners have died. The guards don't even bother to try to pull them out of the mine. Hogan thinks about the wives on the other side of the world that will likely never know where their husbands died. One day, a man in uniform will turn up at their doors and deliver a message, missing in action. Day 30. Hogan has a new job. He's tilling the ground so sugarcane can be planted. The work is simple enough. Take out all the larger stones and put them in a basket. The stones will later be transported. Nothing goes to waste. He starts at 7 a.m. and works until 5 p.m. He's given one break all day. He does this work on an empty stomach and under the scorching sun. Some of the prisoners collapse in the field, and at the end of the day, when work is inspected, they're told they haven't met their stone quota. As a punishment, each man is beaten with a stick. Hogan watches in horror as one starved man, his legs full of fluid from malnutrition, has water beaten out of his wounds. The man who ordered the beatings, First Lieutenant Tamaki, is a sadist. An evil grin widens on his face as he announces he has another quota. He intends to fill the cemetery before the war is finished, and Japan is victorious. As Hogan is lying on his bed, he thinks about flowers and his farmhouse back in Ohio. He can almost smell the bread that flowers told him about. He imagines flowers, a good-looking man waking up next to his pretty wife. He just hopes flowers is okay. Day 40. Today, there are new arrivals, about 15 men, mainly American, start filling the huts. A high-ranking prisoner named Priestley has just come from the Shirakawa camp, also in Taiwan. He tells Hogan the guards there allowed the prisoners to form a scout group. They were also allowed to put on plays, and they even made a magazine they called Taggle Raggle. Priestley tells Hogan they were almost worked to death and survived on meager rations, but the Japanese soldiers were also half-starved. The soldiers knew that demoralized men don't work well, so instead of beating the prisoners, they tried to improve morale. And get this, says Priestley, the guards even took them on fishing trips. What? says Hogan, laughing. Priestley tells them that it was likely just propaganda to show outsiders that they looked after POWs like a civilized nation would. Still, they were also allowed to listen to the gramophone music and Radio Tokyo every day they got English-language Japanese newspapers to read. Priestley laughs again, explaining that on Radio Tokyo there was a woman presenter who went by the name of Tokyo Rose. She delivered news in English saying ridiculous things. This was more propaganda. One day she announced that an American plane had been shot down with nothing but rice balls. Day 50. Hogan is told by another new prisoner about a military prison called Taihoku City Prison. The prisoner says some US Navy fighter pilots and Army Air Force fighter pilots and bomber air crews were sent there to be interrogated, and they never made it out. After forced confessions and a mock trial, the men were sentenced to death. The new prisoner tells Hogan that he was there when 25 US airmen were taken into the prison courtyard and executed by firing squad. It was a sad day indeed, more so because the men were executed for effectively just doing their job flying planes. 
This is a war crime, but Japan doesn't seem to care. Much worse is happening right now in other camps. Hogan is about to find out. Day 88 One of the men in Hogan's camp, driven insane by hunger, is being executed today for attacking a guard. He really hurt the guard, so the Japanese want to make an example out of him. The man, an Australian named John Goodson, is brought out by the guards and forced to kneel. He's then given two minutes to pray. Around him, the guards stand holding fixed bayonets in their hands. Goodson bends over, offering his neck to the executioner. The executioner lifts his sword above his head and then carefully lowers the blade to Goodson's neck. He then holds it aloft once more and strikes down, cleanly severing the head from Goodson's body. Some prisoners watching hear a hissing sound for a moment as they watch his head tumble forward and blood fizz out. After the prisoners return to their huts, one of them writes in his diary, It's amazing. He's killed him with one stroke. The head detached from the trunk rolled forward in front of it. The dark blood gushes. It's all over. The head is dead white like a doll. A Dutch prisoner named Jan Bras, who's just come from another camp, surprises everyone when he says Goodson was fortunate. Bras tells them that the Japanese captured his father and the guards put a tube into his mouth. They then poured water down the tube until his stomach burst. Tommy listens to all these stories with a stricken look on his face. He catches Hogan's eye, who's now wondering what kind of hell Tommy endured in Thailand. Yet again, Hogan wonders what fate might have befallen his buddy, Flowers. Day 250 It's only now that Tommy feels like sharing his story with Hogan about what happened when he was building that railway. This was a 250-mile track that connected Thailand to Burma, an important piece of war infrastructure that helped the Japanese move men and equipment. Tommy had worked on a bridge, what the Allies called the bridge over the River Kwai. At first, Thailand had wanted no part in the war, but after the Japanese entered the country, surrender soon followed. The railway was to be a feat of engineering that would pass over rivers and through rugged jungle terrain. Nonetheless, the Japanese expressed that time was of the essence. Whatever it takes, they said, get that track done fast. Hell ships and trains started to bring prisoners over to Thailand, although many civilians were also forced into slavery to complete the project. This included 90,000 Burmese and 75,000 Malayans, many of whom would eventually die. As Tommy tells this story, at one point he becomes sentimental when he tells Hogan about a Scottish bloke named John Many. Without the Japanese knowing, many drew sketches of the backbreaking work they were doing. Tommy explains that the men were dropping like flies from overwork and fierce heat. Some were beaten to death before his eyes, while others died from malaria, cholera, and sometimes tropical ulcers. Even though there were some foreign medics, hardly anyone had experience with tropical diseases. Each day and every night, the homemade funeral pyres burned. The stink of rotten flesh filled the men's noses every night before they went to sleep. But Tommy says it was the guard's brutality he'll never forget. He said that one of his Australian mates, Ringer Edwards, and two other guys were punished by the Japanese for stealing cattle. They strung the men up crucifixion style and beat them with bats. The other prisoners were told not to go near them as they slowly died. It was a death sentence, but after 63 hours, Ringer managed to free himself from his wire binds. Some of the other prisoners steeked him some food. He survived the ordeal, but the other two men crucified with him died. It was like that day after day, says Tommy. We worked 18 hours a day, mostly in mosquito-infested jungles, and if for a moment we stopped, we were beaten horrendously. They received rations of water, but never clean water. They sometimes got meat with their rice, but it was often foul and full of maggots. It's one reason why a third of the deaths were from dysentery and diarrhea. Tommy says there was a hero who treated the men, who often stood up to the Japanese despite the risk. He was an Australian army surgeon named Ernest Weary Dunlop. But in spite of Dunlop's valiant efforts, there were just too many sick men. When the disease or the beatings were just too much, the men were taken to the death hut to die in peace. Tommy said he'd go to sleep at night and wake up among men who died in their sleep. The Japanese army didn't give a damn. These men had surrendered, so they were worthy of no respect. Tommy tells Hogan the guards were often unpredictable, so one day you could make one laugh, and the next he'd beat you senseless. Tommy's face expresses utter disgust when he tells Hogan, my good mate Banksy, thought he was getting along with a guard we called Pumpkin on account of his large head. One day he tried to cage a cig off Pumpkin and he took offense. He was beaten to death in front of my eyes. Hogan finds this hard to listen to, and he's wondering what SIG means. His hopes would be buoyed if he knew what was happening in Europe. Germany's taken a sound beating on the western and eastern front. Moreover, the US has Japan on the back foot. American troops at times are actually committing their own war crimes by massacring surrendering Japanese soldiers. Sometimes they mutilate the dead, and what they sometimes did with the women is unspeakable. They are at least winning. Day 300 the Japanese War Ministry has just announced that commandants at all POW camps should prepare for the final disposition. This means that if the Allies should invade, the camps are to be liquidated. The Ministry explains it is the aim not to allow the escape of a single one to annihilate them all. 
and not to leave any traces. Hogan doesn't know it, but there's a date hanging over his head for extermination. Day 315. Something's happened, but the prisoners have no idea what. The guards, every last one of them, look depressed. This must be good news, thinks Hogan, as he tries to conceal his joy. Day 320. Have you heard? Tommy says to Hogan. Hogan looks nonplussed. The Japs, they've surrendered. One of the British men in the same hut opens his diary and writes, Things are happening. First got a tip off of Japan tossing it in. The war is over and in a few days we shall be free. No more hunger, disease and crowding, filth and ill treatment. Just to see our people again. What a feeling. Day 321. Tommy writes in his diary, We heard that a devastating bomb has been dropped on Hiroshima and practically wiped it and its population out. Still, now the men are wondering if a super bomb will drop on them too. The fear is evident on all the men's faces. To be killed by the Allies when they have suffered for so long. Day 323. Allied soldiers parachute into Taiwan. They bring food and supplies with them. This Allied Liberation Force is heavily armed in case they meet with any resistance. In a Thai prison camp not far from the Death Railway, a man writes in his diary, Suddenly, the camp lights went full on. The guards had gone. We thought at first they had gone to have some sake, but they never returned. Suddenly, the band started to play Land of Hope and Glory. In a Japanese camp, another prisoner writes, Excitement is at a fever pitch. It must have been 10 a.m. when the first aircraft engines we heard. We yelled and waved like mad, but they passed over. Then came the most beautiful sight I'd ever seen. They had spotted us. Day 330. Hogan and the other men are released. Many of them now weigh under 100 pounds. They're told not to eat too quickly, otherwise they'll get ill. Japanese guards, some of whom have beaten the prisoners time and again, hand out cigarettes. The prisoners are too happy right now to think about reprisals. It's only when they find out that the Japanese have been hiding Red Cross parcels from them all the time. Prisoners have died of starvation when food was there for them to eat. Some men are so sick with malnutrition they'll make it home but succumb to illness within weeks. Day 331. A tragedy happens. With the best intentions, the US drops 60-gallon oil drums full of food and supplies from the skies. But the parachutes don't open. One prisoner writes, some hit the building, and the tragedy of it all was that after surviving three and a half years of captivity, three prisoners were killed as well as Japanese soldiers and Taiwanese civilians. Day 332. American Marines are liberating the last of the Taiwanese camps. Some prisoners have to be carried like children in the Liberator's arms. They're taken to the docks where they're put onto an American destroyer. From his cabin, a man writes, Taiwan became a speck on the horizon. I felt it was an escape from hell. At the same time, British paratroopers are taking men from another camp. Some of them are so weak, they die before they even get to the ship. But many are rejoicing and already thinking about life back home. Day 333. Hogan's ship is in the middle of the ocean heading back to the US. As he goes for a stroll along the deck, he sees a face he's wanted to see for a long time. It's Flowers. He's alive. The two embrace like long-lost brothers. Flowers has a similar story to tell. He was at a Japanese camp, but as time went on and he was sure he was going to die, he and some other men attempted to escape. It didn't go too well for him. He was accused of being a ringleader and sent to a military prison. There, he was interrogated and tortured by the Kinpaitai. I met some more Americans in there, he tells Hogan, but I don't know what happened to them. He'd actually met some of the nine soldiers whose US B-29 Superfortress had been rammed by a Japanese fighter plane. It crashed and the men were arrested. Those nine men were experimented on by the Japanese. They had seawater injected into them. One had a bit of his lung removed, another lost his liver and another part of his brain. These brutal surgeries were likely performed without anesthetic being administered. All the men died. Flowers doesn't know he was due to be sent to Unit 731. This was the center of brutal medical experiments where the Japanese killed over 500,000 people, mostly Chinese, many of whom were women and children. No one who went into that came back out alive. If the war had not ended, Flowers might have experienced vivisection without an anesthetic. He might have been frozen to death or been set on fire with a flamethrower. He could have been injected with diseases or had a biological weapon tested on him. He might have had a limb amputated, been injected with horse blood, or had his stomach surgically removed. But as he chats with Hogan, so glad to be alive, he has no idea how close he came to that dreadful fate. Americans won't know about such atrocities for many years because the US authorities gave many of the Japanese doctors immunity. They covered the whole thing up to gain the knowledge of the human experiments. After all, the Soviet Union was now a threat. World peace was off the table, again. It's not something Flowers and Hogan were aware of as they look out over the ocean. They're just happy to be alive. When they return home, Flowers to his Ohio farm and Hogan to his beloved New Jersey, they'll commit themselves to their own cover-up. Nobody needs to know what they've endured and seen. They won't think about the camps themselves, not often, other than when the horrors infiltrate their dreams. With Asia behind them and America in the distance, they silently agree it's time to start life over again. 
Now, you need to hear full detail about Unit 731 in The Horrors of Unit 731, or get down with an alternative reality and what if Japan was never hit by nuclear bombs.